Hey everybody, this is Patrick JMT and I'm partnering with Chegg, and here we're going to do an introduction to the divergence theorem. So we'll see how this is uh, an extension of Green's theorem. So the extension of Green's theorem to the divergence theorem, it's just like a higher dimension version of Green's theorem. And we'll use the divergence theorem to calculate some surface integrals, or equivalently, we're finding the flux. So recall Green's theorem said if C is a positively oriented boundary curve of the plane region D, then we had this relationship. And again, what you're doing is you're, you've got this double integral, so we're integrating over this, this plane region D, and it says we can turn that into a single integral just involving the boundary of that plane region D. We can just look at that, that boundary curve C. And again, this is like an analog to the fundamental theorem of calculus because the divergence is basically like a derivative. So it says, hey, if you integrate a derivative, you're just back to um, a single integral in this case. The same thing. So suppose we want to extend this. So now it says we're, uh, we're calculating this triple integral. So we're integrating over some volume, some three-dimensional object. It says we can actually turn that into you know, the same formula as above, but now we're just integrating over the surface of that three-dimensional object. So we went from a plane, the, you know, the boundary of a plane would just be that, that curve, and now the boundary of a three-dimensional object is going to be a surface. And we're wondering, well, is, is this, does this relationship still hold? And it turns out, yeah, under certain conditions, it does in fact hold. So I'll let you read all the conditions here. Um, but yeah, so it says we can, we can now compute using, using this formula. So recall that this value on the left side, that, that finds the flux. So we're really calculating the flux of, uh, in, in all of these cases. <clears throat> okay, so let's do a couple examples. So here I've got f of x, y, z equals e to the x sine y i plus e to the x cosine y j plus y z squared k. And s is going to be the surface of the box bounded by the planes x equals 0, x equals 1, y equals 0, y equals 1, z equals 0, and z equals 2. So to get started, you'll find the divergence. And this is what we're going to, this is going to end up being our integrand. So we'll take the partial with respect to x of e to the x sine y plus the partial with respect to y of e to the x cosine y, plus the partial with respect to z of y times z squared. Okay, so if we take the partial, <clears throat> the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. We'll leave the sine y alone. The derivative, the partial derivative with respect to y of cosine y is going to be negative sine y. So we'll have negative e to the x times sine y. And then the partial with respect to z, again, we'll leave the y alone. We'll have 2 times, we'll have y times 2z, or 2yz. So notice in this case, those first two terms just cancel, and we're left with 2 times y times z. So now we have to set up our triple integral. And this is something that you need to keep in mind. Um, should, you, know, you may use Cartesian coordinates, you may use cylindrical coordinates, you may use spherical coordinates to describe this region. And that's something, probably to me, this is gonna be the, the common mistake or the tricky part, is just describing that region. I think finding the divergence and doing the partials in general hopefully won't be too bad. Okay, so we're integrating two times y times z. So let's integrate with respect to z, and then with respect to y, and then with respect to x. Well, z is bounded by the planes zero to two, y is trapped between 0 and 1, and x is trapped between 0 and 1. So certainly I think it makes sense in this case just to stick with Cartesian coordinates. All right, so let's just do some integration here. So we'll go from 0 to 1, 0 to 1. A lot of these you can use Fubini's theorem too and break them out, but I'll just do it uh, sort of the, the standard way. So if I integrate z to the first, I would get z squared over 2, which would cancel with our 2. So I would just have y times z squared. And, okay, so this is going to be from z equals 0 to z equals 2. Then we'll integrate with respect to y and with respect to x. So this would not look too terrible. Okay, so let's see. If we plug in z equals 2, we'll get 2 squared or 4. We'll get 4y. Notice when we plug in our lo lower limit of integration, we would have z equals 0. So the lower limit would just be gone. And now we can just keep chugging along here. So let's see. So I've got from 0 to 1. Now if I integrate with respect to y, I would have 4y squared over 2. 
or simply just 2y squared. And again, this is being evaluated now from y equals 0 to y equals 1, and then we have to integrate with respect to x. Well, if I plug in y equals 1, we'll just be left with 2. And if we plug in y equals 0, again, the lower limit's going to be 0, so we're just left with 2. Again, we have to integrate that with respect to x, so that's just going to be 2x. Again, from 0 to 1, if we plug in the upper limit, we'll get 2. The lower limit will be 0. So it says our solution will simply be um, equal to 2. Let's look at at least one more here. So same thing. Uh, so here our function f is equal to x to the fourth i minus x to the third z squared j plus 4x y squared z times k. And s is going to be the surface of the solid bounded by the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 1. And the planes z equals x plus 2 and z equals 0. Okay, so again, let's just compute this divergence. So the partial with respect to x of x to the fourth plus the partial with respect to y of negative x to the third times z squared plus the partial um, with respect to z of our last term, 4xy squared times z. So the partial with respect to x of x to the fourth, that's just going to be 4x to the third. Notice our middle term doesn't involve y, so when we take the partial with respect to y, since we're treating those like a constant, that whole, that all of this is just going to become zero. And the last part, if we take the partial with respect to z, well, we would just be left with the other stuff, 4x times y squared. And when I looked at this, I went ahead and factored out a 4x. We're left with x squared plus y squared. Okay, so <clears throat> when I went to integrate this, since we're uh, trapped by the cylinder, I'm thinking, well, maybe we should use cylindrical coordinates. And that's, in fact, what, what I decided to do. So I'm going to integrate with respect to z, um, with respect to r, and with respect to theta. Remember, when we use cylindrical coordinates, we pick up this extra r, so don't forget about that. And let's see, I'm going to give myself a little more space here. So our integrand would be 4 times x, so 4 times x, but remember in cylindrical coordinates, x is equal to r times cosine of theta. And recall that x squared plus y squared, that's simply equal to r squared. So this is now going to be our integrand. <clears throat> and now we have to express, again, our, um, our surface using cylindrical coordinates. So z is bounded below by 0. It's bounded above by x plus 2. Well, again, though, x is equal to r times cosine of theta. So our upper limit will be r cosine theta plus 2. Uh, we're, we're bounded, we're trapped by the cylinder. So our radius is going to range from 0 to 1 because the cylinder has a radius of 1. And to go all the way around the cylinder, theta would have to range from 0 to 2 pi. So that's now going to be our limits of integration. So again, now we're just back to, to grinding this out. So we have from 0 to 2 pi, 0 to 1, 0 to r cosine of theta plus 2. Let's see. Um, if we clean this up a little bit, what have we got? So we've got an r times an r squared times an r. That's going to be an r to the fourth. So we've got 4 times r to the fourth <clears throat> times cosine of theta. And again, dz, dr, d theta. Okay, so now we are off to the races. Again, I think this would be a candidate where you could break this up, but it don't matter to me. So, okay, so if we integrate this with respect to z, since all of this is being treated like a constant, we'll just have 4 times r to the 4th times cosine of theta times z. And again, this is from z equals 0 to z equals the upper limit, which is r times cosine of theta plus 2 dr d theta after that. So if we substitute, so we'll have 4 times r to the 4th times cosine of theta. Let's see, our upper limit is going to be r times cosine of theta plus 2. Notice when we substitute in our lower limit of integration, we'll just have, since z equals 0, our lower limit will be equal to 0. So then we have to integrate with respect to r and with respect to theta. All right, so let's keep working on this. So I'm going to distribute this out. It looks like we would have, what, 4 times r to the 5th times cosine squared theta plus 
eight r to the fourth times cosine theta. And now we're integrating with respect to r and with respect to theta. All right, so again, this is shouldn't be too bad to integrate. So we've got from zero to two pi. So now I'm treating r like my variable. So if I integrate four r to the fifth, I would get four r to the sixth over six, leaving the cosine squared theta alone. Plus I would have eight times r to the fifth over five times cosine of theta. Again, this is when r ranges from zero to r equals one. All right, so when we plug in our upper limit of integration of r equals one, okay, this is just gonna be four over six or two thirds times cosine squared of theta. Plus, again, we'll just plug in r equals one. So we'll have eight fifths times cosine of theta. And just like our other ones, um, when we plug in our lower limit of r equals zero, we'll get cosine of zero. Cosine of zero um, is gonna be equal to did I do something crazy here? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm plugging it into the wrong place. Okay, we're plugging in r equals one. I knew I was doing something wrong here. Again, I had to stop and think for a second. When we plug in r equals one, okay, we get our first term. When we plug in r equals zero, we're gonna get zero here and zero here. For some reason, for a second, I was wanting to plug it into the cosine and not into the, for r. Okay, so our lower limit will be zero again, okay. Had to slow down for a second. Okay, so now we're gonna integrate this with respect to theta. Well, the only thing that's maybe a little tricky here is integrating cosine squared. We can use a trig identity on that. So remember the trig identity for cosine squared of theta is one plus cosine of two theta over two. We still have our plus eight fifths times cosine of theta hanging out, d theta. So it looks like the twos would cancel out here. So we've got from zero to two pi, we've got one third uh, multiplied by one, which will be one third, plus one third times cosine of two theta. So I'm just distributing the one third out, plus eight fifths times cosine of theta, d theta. All right, so if we integrate this with respect to theta, we'll have one third theta plus one third. Well, the antiderivative of cosine of two theta would be sine of two theta over two plus eight fifths times sine of theta. And again, we're just plugging in theta equals zero and theta equals two pi. All right, so what are we gonna get here? I still like drawing my unit circle and thinking about it. Okay, so when we plug in our upper limit of two pi, we'll have one third times two pi plus one sixth times sine of, uh, so I'm plugging in two pi, so we'll have sine of four pi plus eight fifths times sine of two pi. And then we'll plug in our lower limit of integration. Um, notice we'll get a zero here. We'll get sine of zero. Remember sine of zero is zero. Again, we'll get a sine of zero, which is zero. So our lower limit's gonna be equal to zero. Just like sine of zero is equal to zero, sine of two pi is gonna be equal to zero. Sine of four pi is gonna be equal to zero. So to me, it looks like you're just simply left with two pi divided by three. So, okay. Um, yeah, so a couple examples. I mean, again, you know, I think computing the divergence shouldn't be too bad. You're just doing partials. And then after that, again, I think the the, the tricky part, if, if there is a tricky part, is going to be producing, you know, good limits of integration. And there's certainly, again, like I said, examples where you may use spherical coordinates. You saw our first one, we used Cartesian coordinates. Here's an example where it's easiest to use cylindrical coordinates. So just make sure you're familiar with that stuff because I think if there's a stumbling block, it would be that. Um, as I so adequately illustrated, uh, be careful when you're plugging in your limits of integration because I almost did something almost did something crazy there. I started plugging things into the wrong place. That's why I like to label these. Um, sometimes when you look at solutions or textbooks, they may not label them. I think it's definitely a good habit just to remind yourself uh, where you're plugging things in. That's kind of what helped me um, 
clear my thoughts there. Um, so, okay, yeah. Um, and after that, you know, just everything's fair game. You may have to use integration by parts. You may have to use trig identities. Who knows, you know, just all the integration techniques also come into it. So lots of things going on here, but hopefully getting things set up and getting started won't be too bad. And I hope these two examples help point you in the right direction.